Hi, I'm JP Hong from Seoul, Korea. Thank you for the invitation to take part in the master series. Today I'll be talking about what has been the innovation and will be in the innovations for microsurgery. If you look at microsurgery and reconstruction, while reconstruction has been dating back to around 600 BC, microsurgery itself has only been around 50, maximum 60 years. And the most recent innovation has been made in the last few decades where since the microsurgery was introduced, now we're using perforator flaps and going on to freestyle. And now we're in the realm of operating on very small artery, which is called super microsurgery. And based on these latest um, evolution and innovation, now we're able to do face transplant by this wonderful case by Dr. Rodriguez or do lymphedema surgery introduced by pioneers like Kushima, Dave Chang, and Jaume Masia, and able to do bilateral leg transplant or toe to finger transplantations to maximize the function of the fingers and do gender surgery and gender reassignment surgery, or even help this poor child out who had no bilateral hands by giving him um, functioning hands through transplant by shown by Dr. Levin. So all this and including the chimeric con concept of operating on lower extremity, uh, even operating on ischemic diabetic foot, all these surgery and all these surgeons, what they have in common is they have the ability to innovate and really get out of their comfort zone and really jump beyond and really make the magic happen. So that is what innovation in microsurgery is about. And today I'd like to share with you some of my journey, which I've been lucky to have till now in the field of microsurgery. Now, if you look at the definition of innovation, it's introduced as new, or it's basically to renew, restore, or to change. Doesn't this sound very common to you? Renew, restore, change? That's what is plastic surgery, the definition of plastic surgery. And in a way, it's the definition of reconstructive uh, microsurgery. And there's no actually having a complete something new, but it's rather combining knowledge to overcome challenges and to implement evidence-based plastic surgery, ultimately to achieve better function and aesthetics. And that's what innovation is all about. My journey started with ALT, which was seen to be the ideal flap of that time introduced by Dr. Koshima. But I had a lot of questions to ask. Is this really a thin flap? Can we make it better? And with these questions, I was able to come up with a concept of using thin flaps by asking, how can I thin it? How can I do it reliably? And even doing animal studies to get some more better idea and ultimately came up with the idea of elevating the flap in the superficial fascia to make it easy and reliable. And I found out that this superficial fascia is not only possible in the ALT, but it's applicable in most of the perforator flaps. And since that introduction, now we've been going thinner and thinner from starting from subfascial elevation, superfascial elevation, super thin flap based on superficial fascia, and then ultra thin flap, a little bit between the superficial fat, and then pure skin perforator flap. So this has been igniting an evolution of making flaps thinner and thinner. The next question I had was, can I have a better donor site than ALT? And we revisited the groin flap, which was introduced by Dr. Taylor. And then we looked into the skip flap as well, which was introduced by Dr. Kushima. And we further made other um, contributions by, again, elevating in the superficial fascial plane and then asking a lot of questions in regards to the anatomy, made a more clear definition of the medial superficial branch versus the lateral deep branch and found out it was much more simpler doing um, the anastomosis based on the medial superficial branch. And as we were doing the um, skip flap, we came across, you know, going from bipolar to monopolar to scissors. And this was a very cumbersome or troublesome uh, and wasted a lot of time. So we basically asked ourselves, can we do it simpler, easier and safer? And came up with the concept of using monopolar bobby cutting mode to not go back and forth bipolar monopolar, but just do everything on a monopolar with a dissection. And since there was no evidence to support our ideas, what we did was we did an animal study and basically found out that monopolar on a high power cutting mode was not different than using bipolar or using scissors. 
the heat radiation was almost the same. And what was more interesting is that when we look at the electron microscope, bipolar sometimes could be more hazardous. So we basically took this idea, uh, built the hypothesis, built the evidence, and now we're doing all our elevation uh, based on using a monopolar bobby cutting mode, as you can see in this uh, video. And the question I ask you, is it really better to be sorry than safe? No, sometimes you have to challenge yourself and sometimes you are sorry because you never did it. And the one who, where our future is created by those who replace the status quo, not by those defending it. So it's okay to be sorry sometimes. It's okay not to be safe and challenge yourselves to move on. And then because of using the skip flap and because of using the media pufferator, we basically had a very short pufferator and hence the concept of using the pufferator as a recipient and came the pufferator pufferator um, uh, anastomosis, which really saved a lot of time. And as I was doing a lot of extremity, uh, do we always have to do dangling? That was the next question I asked. And it turns out that you do dangling because you have to accommodate the flap when it swells. But if you prevent the flap from swelling, then maybe you don't have to dangle at all. And hence the idea of early compression compared to dangling. And it turns out that it worked fine with early compression. It did not harm the flap in any way. And as we were doing this uh, early compression, we were curious to see whether or not the flap was okay, whether the pedicle was being compressed or not. And we started to toy with uh, the ultrasound and we started to measure the velocity of the flow. And what we also found out was that sometimes when you rotate the propeller flap on one side compared to the other, the velocity turned out not to be the same. And now we always have a favorable side of rotation of the pufferator flap using this kind of um, ultrasound. And this all stem out from asking the question, why, cannot, why can we avoid dangling? And then measure the velocity and then use the ultrasound. And now we're using ultrasound as a preoperative, intraoperative, and postoperative monitoring for all flaps. And ultrasound is becoming an integral part, not only in uh, microsurgery for flaps, but also in finding functional lymphatic vessel as using this ultra high frequency ultrasound. And now using the ultrasound, we're able to clarify the anatomy, understand better physiology, and basically save a lot of time making the operation very efficient. And while we're doing this, we actually came up with a number to show that minimum velocity of 15 to 20 centimeters per sec was required for a flap to survive, at least a pufferator flap. And knowing this, we were able to start now addressing reconstruction even for ischemic diabetic foot and to avoid amputation. And that has been the journey of my evolution in microsurgery. And as you can see, what do we have this in common? It's all about asking questions. It's all about trying to get out of your comfort zone. And that all starts by asking why. And this is not easy because a lot of the times we were educated in a way that, you know, we were taught not to ask questions, just to accept what we're taught and do what works and sort of came up with a very fixed mindset when we graduated from university and even through our training. But you have to get rid of that fixed mindset and you have to have that growth mindset where you're not afraid to fail, where you keep on asking questions and you're inspired by other people instead of getting jealous. And most of all, you persevere, you try again and you know that you can do it in the future. And that is what innovation is all about, having that growth mindset. So it all starts by asking why and create a hypothesis. If you, if you have a question, ask and, and create a hypothesis. Why can I do this? Why can't I thin the flap? And then once you have these questions, you have to always look for a better way to do it. All you have to do is find that the answer is out there. And if the answer is not out there, you do the research, you do animal studies, or you look at other references. And then through this process, you build a proof of concept. You build a proof of concept for the hypothesis you had. And once you have this small proof, you communicate with your peers, you take it to your teachers, and then you continue communicating and refine the hypothesis, refine and find more proof 
for your hypothesis. I was lucky to have many mentors in my life and have a great team to work with. And the basic foundation to having great mentors and having a great team is that you have to be candid with each other. You have to give them constructive criticism. Don't make it personal, but really make it professional and really want them to grow. That's what being a great mentor and that's what having a great team is all about. And once in a while, go have fun. And if you don't have this kind of environment or teachers, maximize the age of social media. Go find answers in Facebook or Twitter or other open access journals. The world can be a teacher only if you allowed it. So if you don't have a resource, look beyond your college, look beyond your city, look beyond your country, and you'll somehow find mentors who will guide you through this process of your evolution in microsurgery. And when you have this proof of concept, when you have a question, when you build a proof of concept, when you collaborate it with your peers to refine it, finally, you have to do it. Always with you, what cannot be done. Hear you nothing that I say. You must unlearn what you have learned. All right, I'll give it a try. No, try not. Do or do not. There is no try. Do or do not. There is no try. When you have a hypothesis, when you build your, your proof of concept, you do it and you push it. And sometimes you'll fail. But that's what part of microsurgery is all about. If they say, I never failed, he probably didn't do a lot of, he or she probably didn't do a lot of cases. And failure is part of our job. But as you learn from failure, failure is not really failure. You learn from it and you evolve from it. Failure is real failure when you stop trying. And as you fail and as you learn and as this repeats itself, you evolve, you improve, you overcome. And most of all, you grow to be a better surgeon. And through this process, you will believe that you can do it, as Dr. Kushima has taught me to believe in yourself. So the process of innovation by asking why, trying to find evidence for it, and then communicating your ideas, and then finally putting it into action, that's what innovation is about. And that should not be a one-time deal. You should continue to do it over and over and again and make it a habit. And once you have it as a habit, it becomes behavior and behavior makes your character into a innovative surgeon. So from the ALT to ischemic limb, there has been many evolutions in my journey, but what's next? What is the future? Now we're doing lymphedema, bionic limb, robot-based microsurgery and augmented reality. There's so much innovations that to be made. Now in imaging, we have better laser tomography where we're able to actually see the lumen, whether the lumen of the lymph uh, lymphatic vessel is patent or not. There's so much new technologies going on. Or what about robot limb and using TMRs, targeted muscle renovations or uh, nerve interfaces and actually hooking them up with robotic a circuit and making the, the limb move according to his or her will. This is the age of the cyborg. And I truly believe that this age of using and being assisted with robotic limb are very near. If you have fine tremors, it's okay. We have robots now that will assist super microsurgery as Dr. Innocenti has shown. This is exciting. Now everybody's going to do uh, super microsurgery with ease. And what about virtual reality, augmented reality? We're able to see through the skin and actually see what is wrong, what is the pathology, what is the physiology of this condition. So there's so much innovations that are going on. And hopefully there'll be more exciting innovations in the future. And the future is only if you allow it to be. So I give you this last slide. There are three types of persons in the world who makes it happen, who just watches it happen, and who don't know what the hell happened. 
what kind of future do you want in your life? I certainly know what I want. So that has been my brief journey of evolution or innovation in microsurgery in my practice. And now I'm seeing more great changes, more rapid changes, more rapid innovations from facial transplant to augmented reality. We live in such a fast world, but it's only you that is going to able to make this future happen. Keep your eyes open, keep your mind open to the new world and be part of it. So with that, thank you very much. And I hope to answer any questions.